Hello, and welcome to another installment of our short videos brought to you by Conservation Diver, training the next generation of marine conservationists. Today we are going to talk a little bit about coral nurseries, which are a tool used by reef managers and coral restorationists around the globe. This video gives a short introduction to what coral nurseries are and how they are used, but it is not a replacement for proper training. We do not recommend anybody get involved in such activities until they are properly trained in reef monitoring and research, and also have a good thorough understanding of the ecosystems they are working in. After monitoring and research has identified that there is a problem with the reef ecosystem, both passive and active restoration measures can begin. These measures are generally focused on increasing reef health, abundance, and biodiversity. Together, these three factors contribute to what is known as the resilience of the ecosystem, or its ability to withstand or rebound from a disturbance. Restoration can only be effective if addressing the local threats to the reef. So first we must identify what those are and try to alleviate them through what is known as passive restoration. If warranted, we can also implement active restoration programs which is those that put our time and resources into speeding up the recovery process. In some cases, the reef may come back on its own, in which case active restoration is not necessary. We should also remember that protection is always preferred over restoration. However, in today's world, that's often a luxury we just don't have, and thus restoration efforts are warranted in some cases. When discussing coral reefs, the major factor to consider is recruitment success. If there's a good supply of coral larvae from adjacent reef, an adequate substrate for the larvae to settle on, then there may be no need for active restoration. However, if water quality is too degraded, then there may be little that can be done until that problem is addressed, in which case that is, should be the focus of any program. If, however, water quality is still okay, then coral restoration can help by increasing coral abundance or adding structure to assist in the recovery of the ecosystem in the area. For our purposes, we utilize what we call the three-step coral restoration system. This is essentially involves creating a feedstock of corals, rearing them on a coral nursery, and then transplanting them to natural or artificial substrates. For the first step, collecting a feedstock of corals, we at Conservation Diver generally prefer using corals produced through our coral spawning and larval culturing programs, which you can find out more about on our website. However, this is not always feasible, so for this video we will talk about asexually produced corals. This generally involves using coral fragments, which are collected from a healthy reef or from within the restoration area itself. A coral fragment is defined as a small, naturally produced piece of living coral that has been broken off of a larger colony by storms, fish, human activity, or other disturbances. It may also include colonies which are currently under threat by various disturbances such as sedimentation, overgrowth, or burial. Here you can see a variety of fragments that were found on the reef by our divers. These are known as corals of opportunity, as they would die if nothing was done, but with a little bit of effort, they can be rehabilitated back to health and put back into the coral reef ecosystem. It's important when collecting corals to be sure that the fragments collected are not already dead. Also, in our programs, we never collect from healthy corals, or what is often called donor corals in other programs, and never intentionally break corals a process which is commonly referred to as fragmentation or fragging. Unfortunately today, many mainstream coral restoration projects use donor corals to produce feedstocks through asexual propagation. Although this looks good to the non-scientists and makes for nice social media posts, each one of these asexually produced colonies is an exact genetic clone of the mother colony. By creating reefs through this technique, genetic diversity is greatly reduced, which can lead to mass mortality events during bleaching years or disease outbreaks. Generally, such programs look good on the short term, 
but have very little long-term success. To quote a paper by Clark and Edwards from 1995, transplanted areas will only be distinguished from untransplanted ones by the greater amount of dead coral in the former. This is because the key to reef resilience and adaptation is diversity. Projects which fail to take into account both species and genetic diversity will at best have a neutral effect, and at worst could actually contribute to the decline of the reefs that they are working in. Once we have collected coral fragments, it is time to rehabilitate them. This is done using coral nurseries. For community-based programs, this is generally done in the ocean, using what are known as midwater nurseries. These tend to be floating nurseries and are away from the reef area being restored, yet at the same water depth to control for light and temperature levels, as corals tend to become locally adapted to such conditions and should not be moved outside of their normal growing depth range. On the nurseries, the corals can be maintained and looked after. Also, by being moved further from shore, they are generally less stressed by sedimentation, predation, competition, and other reef factors, and will grow much faster and have a lower mortality than those on the natural reef. The process is not very complicated, which has led to many non-specialists getting involved. However, it is important to keep in mind that this is a very large commitment. Coral nursery projects should not be initiated unless there is adequate manpower and resources to maintain and care for them for several years. For our purposes, there are generally three types of coral nurseries that we use, as they are cheap, do not require much resources, and work very effectively. The first are platform nurseries. These are floating trays created using PVC netting and tubes into which coral fragments are held in place using nylon tubes. This allows for secure attachment and easy transplanting later into the holes drilled on the natural reef substrates and sometimes utilizing epoxy to hold them in place. The second method commonly employed in our programs is the rope nursery technique. This technique is very effective, uses very few resources, and can accommodate corals of nearly every shape and size. However, removing the corals later from the ropes is not possible but the ropes can easily be moved to artificial reefs. Coral trees are another popular method used around the globe. However, transplanting the corals after the nursery step can be more difficult. Regardless of which method is utilized, corals generally remain on the nurseries for several months to more than a year before becoming large and healthy enough to be transplanted to the restoration area. The last step, transplanting the corals, is probably one of the more difficult steps in the entire process and will be covered in depth in a subsequent video. In our programs, both natural and artificial substrates are utilized depending on the needs of the particular area. For example, in this area that had been reduced to sand due to anchor dropping over many years, our bottle units proved very effective after being filled with corals from our platform nurseries nearby. In this next example, Corals growing on the rope nurseries were easily moved onto a metal structure and quickly established themselves to provide habitat for a wide diversity of reef fishes and other organisms. Regular, long-term monitoring of the fragments is essential to ensure their survival and to track the success of the project. If all of these recommendations are taken into account, coral restoration using coral nurseries can be an effective tool for reef managers to protect and maintain their marine resources, and to help ensure that coral reefs are able to survive in our rapidly changing world. We hope that you have enjoyed this short video. If you are interested in actually getting involved in such efforts, we highly recommend that you take part in a training and certification program. Conservation Diver offers such in-depth, scientifically-based certification courses in many different locations around the globe throughout the year. You can discover more about these on our website. Thank you again, and if you enjoy these videos, be sure to like or subscribe and consider supporting us through Patreon. That way we can continue our efforts at conserving the ecosystems we love and depend upon.